time for the meeting to start, so we will begin. Um, how many of you were on the Friday call? Cass, Shauna, Constantina, Emma. Well, you were on the earlier call, weren't you? Yes. Yeah, you and I did it earlier, right? No. And Rod. No, no, no. no. Uh, I missed last week because of the uh, Vision Quest. It was the week before that you were on early, okay, on, on Thursday. Before. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, 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 right, right. Okay. Yeah, you were on the Vision Quest. I thought there might have been more than just Will. Um, and Rod, you weren't on Friday, or is that not a good day for you, or what? Hey, Kathy. I was, Hi. I was actually on on Friday. You were? Yes. Okay, so I wanted to just start with that because Friday I had a technical problem. My internet crashed about 20 minutes into the call and Constantina filled the gap. And from what I can tell from emails I received from people, it was an extraordinary discussion on gratitude. Um, and I was saying to Constantina, um, I would like her to assist now in these discussions because, as many of you know, I've tried to get you to discuss stuff for the last three weeks and no one says anything. So I figure I'm not very good at the discussion part, but Constantina seems to be really good. But I just wanted to comment from the emails I saw that just doing that work on gratitude seem to have been extraordinarily beneficial to everybody who you most of you were on that call could you make a comment or maybe i should ask constantina to ask you to make a comment <laughs> anybody have anything what did you think well, what did you think because i've heard from people they want more discussion and i'm not quite sure how to get it done except leave the call that seemed to work really well last week <laughs> so but just comments from people how did it go if if i can comment this is roderick um and jim i just want to say in my opinion with you not being present it forced me to have to speak <laughs> um i don't think that there's any um uh, any poor tactics or anything that you're not doing to uh to make the space available for us to speak um i think that for me I, you just became i became reliant on you talking during the time and i and i just kind of stayed in the background so you know i, I think that you've made um, opportunities for all of us to speak and to share and i think that it's just left up to us to speak and i'm speaking more so for myself than anyone else Good for you. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, go ahead. Jim, I wanted to add really quickly that I don't think it was me who did anything in regard to bringing the conversation out. I think it was really the goodness of everybody's heart who was helping to fill the gap and, and saw the need and the urgency. And, and we decided to all stay engaged. And everyone helped me uh, in that process. So I think if we continue on in that vein of really helping one another to engage this energy of what we are experiencing in our uh, class, I think we'll all do just fine. And I know we enjoyed it very much when we did have that opportunity to kind of carry on as a group and as a team. And I think, you know, there's a real important part of this because remember the, <clears throat> the sense the the neuropsychology of cultivation is to deepen the experience, really feel it inside. And that kind of interaction is really important to that. So I appreciate that, you know, that it occurred and would like to just encourage more of it because the, as we talked uh, the, the last Monday about words and language, you know, the speaking of the feeling, both, both, well, it installs it a little bit more. And, and um, I wanted to then 
point out one of the learnings out of it, which had come up a little bit in the previous weeks. Um, because, Will, part of it was in relation to what I was saying about the power of language and words in, in both communicating to another and honestly communicating, you know, who we're, what we're thinking, feeling, believing. Um, and a couple of people, and then in the email exchange afterwards, the idea uh, really surfaced about negativity. And what's the difference between negativity and positivity? And what does it mean? Um, and we'll have a discussion on that. Maybe we'll get to it on Friday because negativity as a word come, has emerged out of what the neuroscience world has called the negativity bias of the brain. And in a certain sense, it's a, it's a missed choice. It's a, it's a, it's a weak choice of language. Because when we're, you know, out in the bush 50,000 years ago, and our brain is scanning for threats to our survival, certainly we say it's negativity. But it's so much bigger than that. It's not about whether I feel good or not. And so today, negativity, you know, carries a lot of definitions for all of us. It's way beyond what we say, the amygdala, for example, has two-thirds of the neurons in the amygdala scan for negative news. Now, you know, that isn't applicable to today's situation. So I want to talk more about that on Friday because it's an important part of our practice. And, and many of you have pointed it out, that there are other ways to describe this that are probably more accurate and not sink us into this sense of, oh, if I feel bad, I'm in a negative space and my brain is doing X, Y, and Z, because that isn't necessarily true. Um, and that comes from our discussions. So it was just another point I wanted to make on how important it is that we all explore what we don't understand, what we don't agree with, or other questions we may want to pursue. So to start today, I wanted to go to Will and Dan and maybe Lily, um, starting with Will, to tell us a little bit a little about... Uh, the last week in which um, Will and Judith and others led a vision quest. We're not here for our calls, but we're deep into an experience that certainly is a part of probably what Will will talk about next week. But I wanted to open today with um, a sort of overview from Will and others about how last week went and what it meant and how does it relate to what we're all doing together. Will? Okay, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and I'm really glad to be with you today in, in our circle, and glad you're here. I'm glad to be here myself. I, I value our time together. I value our uh, explorations. Um, it seems to me very important for us to explore the relationship of our own neural system with the larger uh, neural systems. So um, I would just say that for the last 35 years, we've been uh, exploring the relationship of in the Earth tribe with um, ancient ceremony and our newer sciences, including uh, the science of the brain. And Jim, your, your input and your leadership and your ability to uh, frame much of the research that's going on in, <clears throat> with regard to the brain, it, I think is, is very important for our experiences as well. And so over these 35 years, I have viewed uh, our ceremonial experiences 
as practices that allow us to transcend our usual understanding of our mainstream civilization and functioning, including our understanding of the brain. So uh, each year in the spring, we have a, a vision quest and we have the Earth Tribe practice of vision questing without going into great detail is a three year process. The first year people come to a, an encampment that includes uh, somewhere between 35 and 50 people. And they are supporting uh, a relatively small group of eight or 10 people who are actually going out. So the first step in our process is to learn how to support other people who are entering into a transordinary state of consciousness in order to receive a vision for themselves and also for the larger whole. So we see it as a bifocal process. Um, through, through one side of the lens, we're looking for our own healing. And, and next week, both uh, on Monday and Friday, I'll be uh, addressing our personal healing. But through the other lens, we're addressing the healing are the the unfolding of the whole so that's that's the focus the second leg of the journey after attending the camp encampment is to spend a year with a vision guide uh, that prepares one in a process of visioning that culminates with fasting and sitting in a circle over a period of time uh, then the third phase of the process is reintegrating these transordinary states and visions into service and usefulness for the larger uh, planet uh, that we have. So that's been our practice, and uh, we had an incredible time. And I'm going to save a lot of my observations about how this relates to the extended brain next next week I'll be talking about the eco brain and the healing of ourselves and our planet within an extended neural system. That's what I'll be focusing on next week. And I'll be sending out an assignment uh, later this week that will, everyone will have an opportunity to actually do some preparation for those experiences in terms of writing but and rather than talking more myself I want I want to begin with uh, you know we have Dan and Lily and Judith here and so I want to hear from each one of them about their experience of this particular vision quest uh, briefly you know, and then I'll turn it back over to you Jim so let's start with Dan Oh, thank you, Will, and hello, ever, hello everyone. Um, yeah, I'll say a couple of brief things. Um, I've been attending and participating in Vision Quest for about 15 years, and um, and what's uh, what was interesting about this Vision Quest? In previous Vision Quest, we have a a fair a, a map that has evolved, but it's it's a fairly um, regular map for how we'll conduct ourselves through that week. And this time the map, we, I think we threw it out the window about Tuesday of last week and, and, um, and the map evolved and changed all through the vision quest. And the natural order was a big um, contributor to the map that we use to um, have this vision quest. And I think it taught us a lot of lessons about um, our ability as a community to have ceremony include the natural order as part of our um, planning, if you will, and adapting and being flexible given the, the weather and, and the other aspects of the natural order that, that came to play. And ultimately, the, the end result 
for me was a vision quest that had a heightened level of, in, of intimacy. And so the level of intimacy in this vision quest was really quite profound for me. So that's what I have to report. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan. And what Dan is referring to is, if you can think about Gaia has an extended neural system and we're embedded in that, uh, the place where we had a vision quest had uh, 20 inches of rain in a day and a half. So um, uh, we kept trying to make that happen, but it just wouldn't happen. And so we had to make major, major shifts as we went along the way. The shifts were in reference to the larger forces of nature. And let me say, everybody on this call could well take in the fact that we humans increasingly over the next period of time are going to have to shape ourselves around the larger forces of nature. This is no longer a human-centered endeavor that we're engaged in. This is a Gaia-centered endeavor. So I want to pause there. Judith, you have some comments about the week? Sure. Wow, what a week. <laughs> uh, just thinking of how to relate our experience to neuroscience and the brain, the primitive brain in some ways, because um, all of our plans had to go to hell. They went to hell. There was, there was no way we could really uh, complete what we generally do. And we have a map for it. It's, we've followed it for years and years. And, and this time we um, had plan A, B, C, and D over a period of about four days, three or four days of um, watching the weather, talking to our people in Houston. So the fear factor, I think, or the discomfort factor was pretty amplified. And uh, for, until we decided on plan C, once we made a decision, some of our neural cells calmed down and uh, we weren't so panicky. And the, the real beauty of what happened is how the, the community came together to support each other, support the questers, and how giving and open everybody was to things not being what they expected. And it was to me, it was just a, a, a miracle. And um, in general, when we have a vision quest, people would sit out for one or two or maybe even three nights. So that's 48 hours or something like that. And, and so the seven people who came to our property to sit were sitting for four hours. Now that seems pretty extreme when you compare 48 hours to four hours, but the visions, the visions that came to these people were extraordinary, extraordinary. So how that fits in with neuroscience, I think we could figure it out easily. I'm not really up for it today, but, but I, I saw how um, belief, things that people believe, how you can change your beliefs, change your beliefs, change your brain, changes our beliefs. And, and that was very clear to me that all of the expectations were uh, out, of the, out of the door, down the river with the, with the floods. And so um, we just uh, loved each other. I would just say we loved each other. We, we turned... Um, a scary situation into a positive experience. And uh, by the end of the week, um, we had <laughs> nine people, 10 people signing up for Vision Quest next year. So go figure, you know, something happened, something really magical happened. And I think, I think neurologically, we, we created some new pathways, I hope. Good, thank you, Judith. So one of the things I'd also like to point out, and I'll go into deeper, uh, detail about this next week is we have a new form of wilderness emerging in consciousness today. We used to think about wilderness as going out to Mount Denali. For example, one of our students, our wisdom students, uh, Mita Kandia, 
from Brazil who was here, uh, is an expert as a wilderness guide. In fact, she climbed Mount Denali this year as a guide. So she's very familiar with our traditional understanding of wilderness. But what I'd like to point out is the wilderness is coming to us. I define wilderness as the larger forces of nature that disrupt our usual patterns of personality and culture in such a way that, that we are, our patterns are loosened to open ourselves to larger possibilities. <clears throat> and we in this little valley where we live, in about a 10 month period, we have had two thousand year floods. In addition to the one we had last week, where, where at the ranch, our ceremonial and wildlife ranch, we have a 600 acre ranch that we've been restoring for the last 20 years, and it's been restoring us. That's where we had the 20 inches of rain. So <clears throat> this, this is a, this is a wilderness coming to us. You, we, we don't really, I, my, my CPA, who's in Houston, um, one, had, uh, had the waters come up with one, one inch of his house. One of our vision questers had water in their house. Dan and Sheila uh, on Memorial Day had six feet of water in their house. Judith and I have a house where our daughter's going to be moving. We had two feet of water in our house on Halloween. So this is... This is a, and, and by the way, where we live is a semi-desert. So the forces of nature are coming to us, bringing the wilderness and connecting with what? Connecting with the wilderness brain, the wild brain heart. That's what's happening. Gaia is reaching out to us and saying the way, the next phase of evolution will belong to those who develop this larger brain. Uh, <laughs> or at least that's my notion. <laughs> so let's hear from Lily. The three of you said so many wonderful things that I experienced over this uh, encampment. And what I, I guess I noted the most was the, the tears and joy. The tears were joy of the questers as they returned and the impact that nature, the eco field had in promoting this change of mind and ch changing their angst into of the storm and all the changes into this joy and the depth of their vision. So that would be what I would say. But this was a, this was a mind, brain expanding experience <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you will and everyone um i'm thinking well in relation to what we had <clears throat> the comment i made earlier that in addition to your sending out a little assignment Maybe we craft a short email that describes some of what you just said with emphasis on how important this next Monday is for everyone as a way of encouraging, you know, more participation from people who may not have been able to join us recently. But your, your, your comments on how important it is for all of us to expand into this larger self, in a sense, um, are important to get across to people and say, here's your chance, yeah, let's talk about this. So you and I can be in touch on it, but I think that would be a good way of sending out a separate note. Um, so thank you all for, for that. And there are a couple of thoughts I had one you know you were talking about visioning and there is 
some research on the neuroscience of visioning, whatever that means. It means different things to different people. Um, but, and so I'll, I'll touch a little on that um, in the final um, Monday, two weeks now. Uh, but what it brings up for me is another comment that you made about um, throwing out the map and the discomfort factor and how we rely on what's gone before to show us the path forward. And as we know, that's no longer um, the best way to move into this future. Um, but two, it reminds me of our first session where, you know, the history of all of this knowledge has always had points where you have to throw out the map of what came before. And I just want to emphasize that for all of what we're learning here. We're learning something about the little bit we know. And it's giving us sort of an outline of a map. It's certainly giving us a few exercises to practice. And that those may become more refined, but they probably won't go out of date versus the information generally, which continues to be more refined and in a sense fills in the detail of the map because what we're learning here is just the vague outline of what neuroscience is really about. Um, and, and traditional neuroscience doesn't involve that larger brain that we're studying also with Will's guidance. So, I want to emphasize when we discuss things that everybody's comment is very important. There isn't any yes or no answer here. We're exploring together. And what I wanted to do today to kind of pick up a little on what the vision questers have described is go deeper into a part of the larger system um, that is a result of having thrown out the map in the last couple of years. So I want to start, I sent you all the PDF. Um, I want to start with this heart-brain connection because it's very important for um, what Will's talking about and what we're all um, moving into that the brain is way beyond the little organ in our head. We start these with a reminder of what it takes to cultivate, you know, the, the bigger parts of ourselves, especially from activation to insulation, hold it for 20 to 30 seconds and move it into oneself. And the more you practice it, the more part of you. And in the, so then we move into the heart. The heart has an intrinsic nervous system. It operates both independently and dependently, interdependently with the brain. There are 100 million neurons in the heart, they estimate, which have both short and long-term memory. Now, when we talk about other brains, um, from my view, one of the things we have to remember is the brain and the head primarily has a unique component, which is that kind of rational thinking that we all associate with uh, the mind, in a sense. And the brain and the heart and the brain and the larger fields, etc., cetera, um, provide a great deal of information back and forth. Um, and largely, it's done similarly through electromagnetic fields. Heart rhythms produce electromagnetic fields that are measured in the brain waves of other people, for example. The heart is the place where more of our connectivity to others emerges than we're often aware of. And our heart rhythm, the regularity or irregularity of our heartbeat is, has a direct relationship to how well our brain mind is functioning. 
Um, and what has been discovered is that going back to the positive feelings again, as we take in the positive, we also smooth our heart rhythm patterns. And that's our brain functioning in significantly beneficial ways. And one of those is in decision making. And decision making from the skull brain point of view is when we finally figure out we're gonna do this and we say something about it or at least we think. But that's the last step in a series of processes that begins in other parts of the body than just the brain, including the heart. Um, and often, as we have learned in our lifetime, having a realistic and healthy relationship with our heart slash emotional body, um, we have been trained. I was taught as a young um, not to let my emotions get in the way of my of my thinking process, of my decision making. Yet, the research with CEOs, very successful CEOs, uh, shows that most of them make their most important decisions from the gut feeling they have. Though that's only in recent uh, research that has come forth because it wasn't popular to describe that earlier, but even without realizing it, our heart guides us in much of what we do. Probably best known and in many ways um, the most active organization that has been looking into this for the last two decades is the HeartMath Institute and its research center. Um, located in Boulder Creek, California, near Santa Cruz. And they've found all of these various aspects of the heart and its relationship. The heart and the brain communicate. The heart, the access point to a source of wisdom and intelligence. It's a complex information processing center. And it's now become acceptable in the literature to talk about the heart brain because it contains a million neurons. And you know, interestingly, we always have thought about the neuron as a cell in the brain. And in fact, a neuron is a nerve cell throughout the entire nervous system, which can conduct electricity and communicates through electrical and electrochemical simulation. Wow. So as this slide shows, and you know from the way I've done it before, there's a lot of information here. And it's for you to follow up on, learn as you can. But this points the way. There are four ways the heart brain communicates with the, with the skull brain, let's call it. Through the nervous system, through electromagnetic waves, through hormones and neurotransmitters, pulse waves, similar to the way the brain communicates, uh, the skull brain communicates, but in many ways, um, much more intensely. And the HeartMath Institute, which you, you may know something about it, it was founded about 20, um, 25 years ago by Doc Childry, and it is now its system, which I'll describe very briefly in a minute, of bringing the heart pattern in sync with the brain pattern is now used all over the country, especially in California, where they have implemented it. They've taught it to police departments, the military, hospitals, schools, and it's being widely used now in law enforcement in California, where, as you probably know, so many policemen ultimately suffer stress-related diseases and, in fact, commit suicide at an alarming rate. Um, and the heart math system is now having a huge impact on the mental health of policemen um, in the areas where they're training. So this is what the Heart Math Institute is about. It is committed to teaching us how to bring the heart and brain more into line, into sync with one another, and learn to live from the heart's intuitive guidance. So, back to some of what we've learned before. 
negative emotions increase disorder in the heart rhythm, positive emotions create increased harmony and coherence in both the heart and the brain. And when the heart is coherent, there's a, there is greater mental clarity and ability, uh, more effective decision making, a lot of health benefits directly. And this occurs when the heart is coherent, sending out information that causes changes throughout the body, not just in the brain. But the brain is a partner in all of this because the skull brain, in a sense, is the manager of so much of the electrochemical simulation in the body. And with guidance from the heart, the skull brain man manages in a significant way the healthful expression of what happens inside of us. And then when we intentionally experience positive emotions, which we, the heart processes these and begins to become coherent. And here's a little guide, um, a little practice that heart math teaches, just in terms of decision making, but it's the same for just about any uh, challenge you might have. Um, beginning with sort of a mindfulness practice, disengage from your thoughts and feelings. And a primary focus is to put your energy in the heart. So rather than just what we often do is focus on our breath, this is very much a heart-centered practice. And the breathing is imagined coming into and out of the heart. And this practice begins to calm the heart in significant ways. And as you breathe love and appreciation into the heart, again, for 30 seconds, because it begins to install the feeling and the experience and take it into, into long-term storage rather than just leave it behind out of short-term memory. And this heart feeling is one to activate and sustain over numerous practices because this good heart feeling, as you breathe through the heart, extends, remember, we're talking about electromagnetic field from the heart that is at least 60 times larger than the brain. And so as we move into coherence in the heart, it communicates that to our immediate environment in a significant way. And when we combine this with what Will is teaching us about experiencing those fields of the living systems around us, then we really have, in a sense, our brains and the brains around us, for there are multiple ones of them, completely in tune and in sync with one another. And in this particular exercise, from that place, decision-making is an easier task to pursue. On Friday, we talked a little about kindness before I disconnected, and I want to focus the rest of this session on kindness for a couple of reasons. One, as the Dalai Lama says, our brain and our heart is our temple, and its philosophy is kindness. It's our brain and our heart that carries, in a sense, a temple of kindness within us. It is an innate capacity we have. And these particular phrases are out of um, Buddha's Brain, the, the book by Rick Hansen, but it tells us a little about kindness. It's the wish that other beings be happy. It's Compassion is, is a relation, is a relate, has a relationship to kindness. The two things, um, 
come together in significant ways, but they're also a little bit different. Kindness focuses on other beings being happy, whereas compassion is the wish that other beings not suffer and our capacity to have the feeling within us that, that is rushing through the other and doing what we can within ourselves to relieve that suffering. Kindness is the wish that other beings be happy, including ourselves. And it's there all the time. The opportunity is in every moment of every day. It has a loving quality. And so the practice often is called loving kindness. And loving kindness has a very specific and overall effect on the brain. It goes back to some of our work with language and intention. It mobilizes certain areas of the brain that function around language and our capacity to imagine and intend what it is we want to do, who we want to be, how we want to help others. It stimulates neurochemicals like oxytocin. I'll talk a little about it in a minute, but this is a very important um, neurochemical for retarding the aging process and endorphins for increasing our sense of reward. And then, um, so it's very involved in both our emotional and reward networks. It calls on equanimity to keep our hearts open. So it's back to our heart again. This is a practice right out of our work with the heart and the brain. And being on your own side means practicing loving kindness with yourself. So a few um, uh, summaries of the research about kindness, because it's fairly substantial. Um, one, that it's, it's innate within us. In one study with with very young children, a 14-month-old child, who sees somebody struggling with difficulty, will attempt to help. It comes before training. It's an innate aspect of who we are. And I was reminded of it when, when Will, you and Judith and others were talking about the challenges in Texas, because recently I've seen a couple of movies about, about the destruction of the planet. And the way Hollywood portrays it, the focus is on how terrible everybody is when this thing happens. How everybody's out for themselves. They steal everything. But the truth is, and it comes out more and more, whenever there is an extraordinary challenging moment, life-threatening times, like what you all are going through in Texas, it is the time when kindness comes out more than any other time in our life. People come together and help one another in a substantial way. It's inbuilt within us. Kindness also has very positive effects on the brain. Um, regularly engaging in kindness. We create neural pathways that enhance feelings of well-being. We feel better. We are happier when we're in a kind moment. And, for example, when people give to charities, the brain is activated in regions associated with pleasure and social connection. When people give to charities, their brain indicates that they are happier than when they spend it on themselves. It creates a kind of warm glow effect, and it slows the aging process. This warm glow effect is partially created by the hormone oxytocin which is heart protected. It reduces the levels of free radicals and inflammation. It, it uh, stimulates um, certain chemicals in the, in the blood that expand the blood vessels in a way that reduces blood pressure and it has a impact on the longevity of the cardiovascular system. And as it says, there's a strong link now between compassion and the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve controls inflammation levels in the body, um, which, are, which are some of the most important contributors to aging. So kindness 
has incredible effects on us that we're often not aware of. It's contagious. When you see somebody else help somebody, it produces good feelings in me. When I watch somebody, oh, wow, look at that kind person. And it stimulates me to help. When I, I notice, when I drive down the road and somebody's having a problem and, and people have stopped to help, I tend to pull over and go to stop and help because it's contagious. It also reduces the emotional distance between people. And so it contributes to better relationships. Um, and all of this research shows that it makes you happier. Performing an act of kindness and gratitude towards someone who had themselves been kind is one way of consciously performing an act of kindness that makes you happier, like writing a thank you letter and personally delivering it to someone. Or um, the research in Japan that showed the participants who did this and um, counted their acts of kindness over the course of a week, increased their level of reported kindness and gratitude on a, on a subjective scale um, after only a week, let alone those that continued it and the benefits continued for months afterwards. This, what the last two slides have come from, a little HuffPost Healthy Living article that I research that I referenced down below, which gives the references for most of this. But it, um, it brought up for me Gandhi's uh, point that simplest acts of kindness are more powerful than a thousand heads bowing in prayer. Kindness is something that all of us experience and just and display every day almost every moment and therefore given how much it does for us um, our assignment this week is to write down all the acts of kindness you perform and part of this is as I described on Friday we're about becoming or this course is about all of us developing a deeper sense of of our awareness of who we are. Because who we are includes all of what Will teaches us about our capacity to, to apprehend all of the information that's coming in and be led into a larger earth by being in touch with the living systems around us. That's who we are. Who we are also is kind. But often we don't remember or acknowledge it. So a part of being kind to ourselves is over the next week, in addition to our gratitude, we record the acts of kindness that we perform each day. And we look for opportunities. Um, and I especially like this random acts of kindness. There's a whole website on it. And, um, and I'm particularly taken with the idea of an act of kindness that no one knows you did, but other people benefit from. And the best example is that first one. When you know you're not going to make a flight, book a middle seat so the two people on either side of you don't have someone in between them on the flight. It's a kind of random act of kindness that they have no idea you did. So that's another part of this, watch for things to do that will make other people happy without having them know that you're the reason the experience occurred. And so as usual, I finish this with um, the seven practices that we've introduced in this course that we will continue to emphasize. Um, first, the primary philosophy that mind can change the brain, that changes the mind. Focused mental emotional activity gradually changes the heart, brain, mind over time, both conscious and unconscious. And I was struck by, Will, your, your emphasis on how water is beginning to emphasize to people that nature is coming. 
It's coming back. And water, as you know, is often seen as the unconscious. When we dream about water, it's often about the unconscious. And so it's interesting that in those, that deepest part of ourselves, the unconscious, which some people believe is 90 to 95% of everything that happens in our minds, um, it's being brought back to us by nature to say, hey, there's something so much deeper inside of each one of you. And I want to bring it out and I want to, and I want to partner with it. And I want to um, um, assist everybody in all of us becoming more of an ecosystem joined together. So here are the, the seven things that gratitude, taking in the good, being on your own side, moments of choice, those moments, every moment when we can choose to be positive, to be negative, to take in the good, to, to not even pay attention, to be on our own side or deflect a, a compliment, um, take some warm installed memories around with you, be kind whenever possible. And remember that as Will has put it, you know, Mother Earth is now um, actively pursuing a partnership with the human species that can become collaborative and cooperative and helpful for all of us and in its own way contribute to a different kind of civilization, which we're, what we're all about. And these practices are essential to creating the kind of interior resilience um, that everyone on the on the vision quest exhibited over this past week by adapting to radical differences in what they had planned and coming up with a, a vision quest that was unlike any others, but as deep and powerful as anything that they had planned ahead of time. So um, I'll stop there for now. So, comments, questions, Constantina, can you help me get some? <laughs> Maybe, Will, you'd like to say something first? If not, then anyone else, please join in. Uh, Will, if you had anything to say, go ahead. I have something after you. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, I just want to say how much I appreciate Jim, how you've coalesced such a wide range of research and focused it into uh, practices. And um, I, I want to circle back to the discussion you must have had last week, but I didn't get in on, and that is what is the role of negativity? And uh, maybe I'll discuss a little bit next week, but uh, I don't like the term negativity bias. Uh, I think I think there's a major error in our thinking of the early brain as being um, tied in to negativity or even survival. Uh, I. I just think that uh, what we're what we're out of balance with is anxiety, and a an invitation. David Brooks, the columnist, calls the pornography of pessimism, and um, it's easy, I think, for us in this culture to think of sex in pornographic terms. Uh, many, many young people that I'm talking with, people, millennials, <clears throat> are saying, see, they grew up watching pornography. So how does that shape their experience of sexuality, see? So we don't want to throw sexuality out with pornography. And we don't want to throw out negativity and its possibilities because we've become oriented to anxiety. <laughs> so anyway, those are a couple of ideas that I'll, I'll leave open for us to discuss. 
Will, I kind of wanted to follow up on that. And also in regard to the vision question, what happened there? And this, this idea of being op of our openness to anxiety, and I want to bring everybody in on this because I know we've all been there. When the roadmap suddenly changes and the neurons have been used to firing around a particular roadmap, and suddenly that roadmap is trashed. And I, I wanted to know in everybody else's experience, how have you handled that exactly uh, from a neural perspective? And Will, I know you had to make some major changes and your roadmap uh, kind of went down the tubes along with the flood. And I wanted to bring everybody into this, this discussion of how do we react to this? What is the best thing to do to, to uh, move us out of the anxiety that ensues when the roadmap is gone? So if anybody has anything to say, I'm sure you, I'm not the only one who's had trashed roadmaps repeatedly in life. <laughs> so Constantine, I'd like to jump in. This is Van. And, um, and sort of leverage a couple of, of uh, concepts that are going around. And one of them is when Will was talking about negativity bias and um, that term. And then I'm thinking about how we refer to think natural um, occurrences like weather and we assign a value or a judgment value to it's good weather or it's bad weather and that's really kind of interesting because um, what we might define here in the Beverly Valley as good weather would be sunshine and and uh, clear skies and a few years ago we went through several months of sunshine clear skies and no rain and that became a real stress to our, um, to our living here in the valley. And so what we would call good and bad changes from time to time. Um, and so I think what I'm seeing is just letting go of the judgment that we put on and the, we assign a value to certain uh, conditions and that they're not good or bad. They're just, you know, they are what they are. And, um, and then another concept that, that's going around is the, the way in which we engage the natural order in our, um, I'm going to use the word planning, and I'm thinking that that word's going to become obsolete at some point, but um, that we, we use, it, it's as it's though so that we respond to the natural order way down the list in our planning and so our own intentions or our own plans become the at the top of the hierarchy and then we kind of look at the weather or we we look at other natural things and say you know well how's that going to affect our plans rather than putting the natural order kind of at the top of the hierarchy and us respond to that so that's what i had to offer thank you dan Anybody this, else out there? This is Lily. Um, hi, Lily. Hi there. What I kind of noticed with the questers was that they began to make positive statements that encouraged each other to see things from another viewpoint. And that, that tendency of that behavior seemed to shape that love that Judith was talking about. They loved one another into a better place as they were working with things. And that brings me to another thought, just how does that, um, that group dynamic almost work on uh, soothing the neural complaints when the roadmap changes and the compassion that other people show toward the situation and their willingness to be uh, positive about it all. Um, I know in my own life that those type of things have really added toward easing the anxiety and bringing clarity as to, okay, so what now is the roadmap? So, yeah, I agree. It's very good. This is Cass. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so part of what I want to say is related to the whole experience that I'm having just in, in what we've been doing with the gratitude journal and just experiencing life uh, around that. 
Um, and I had sent uh, kind of a summary about that. And I feel uh, like my, my mindfulness or my brain and my heart are becoming more connected, especially after I started doing the gratitude journal. And so I was particularly interested um, in, in the knowledge things that came through this week, Jim, that you sent us, you know, and looking at that. And I love being able to take that knowledge and integrate it into the actual experience that helps me to um, sort of put understanding to what's happening to me. Because I feel like I'm opening in a way that I have not been open either before or even much more than what I've been open previously. And so I, I'm experiencing that integration in my heart center. And I'm kind of making these connections even with the eco field. And in my little summary, I said that I was much more open. So when my heart is open, just in general, I am more open to what's happening in the eco field. And so it was like my connection to the broader, to my broader eco field within my home bounds here in Little Schaefer, Minnesota, that I'm much more aware and feel more connected to that. And one of the sort of um, thoughts that came to my mind was, or came, came to me, was that I, I am, um, you know, I've lost it. It was that I'm feeling more, um, isn't that awful how it just, I'm thinking too much about what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so, but anyway. More than that, I do. <laughs> it's um, that I feel that, that the, I, I've come to an understanding, a different understanding of the importance of allowing the heart to speak so the mind yields to the heart's guidance and that to me is like i've been you know i've been studying that and reading about that and i had that experiential experience like oh i'm getting it okay listen to your heart and that's part of what that will draw me out to make um better decisions or to feel more connected so experientially i feel like in sort of this roundabout way of telling all this is that I'm feeling the, the living science of what you're now talking about. Does that make any sense? I, um, so I feel like I am experiencing listening to my heart and feeling the overall physical improvements of that mental clarity, emotional, um, emotional depth, um, openness. Um, more positiveness all around, and so you know, I'm living proof <laughs> in this moment. Yeah, and I think that's Jim's goal that we end wills that we do experience the living science of this uh, whole process that we're going through. And Jim, you said you had a few comments you'd like to make. Yeah, I wanted to sort of transition from what Cass is saying to. Um, because it's related to this, to this discussion on negativity and positivity. And it's a bigger discussion. We can look at the sort of how the negativity bias phrase emerged. But I wanted to, we have a sense of what it means. It just might mean, may might have specific differences among us. But I wanted to ask, um, Sarah specifically, because Sarah and I talked about this at some length last week, um, and Sarah has had a real experience of shifting to a more positive, um, what, way of viewing the world, Sarah. Could you talk a little bit about what you're going through around this negativity, positivity balancing? I'm just wondering how to speak of this. Um, so my experience has, has been that um, in shifting my focus from um, 
the negativity, but noticing my own patterns in that and shifting to a more positive, so gratitude, appreciations. I actually experienced it as, as a lot of disturbance. Um, and it's almost like the interfacing waves that showed up for me were really strong. Um, but I've been sharing a lot of my um, explorations with, with friends. And the, it's almost like the ripple effect of what I've been understanding has started to kind of infiltrate or impression on other people. And then I'm receiving other information that's much more positive from others as well. But it's, it feels to me that um, as we shift our bias, we naturally go through it's, this disturbance because we're shifting our own our, sh our status quo. And um, as we've been talking, I had this really strong image of, um, of, a, of a tree, you know, as it goes through its layers of growth, as it opens, there's a lot of disturbance in the, almost like in the circle and especially when you go into this thing around expanding the brain, there is, there is implicit chaos because you're opening your, your viewpoint, you're shifting the balance at the same time. It's really physical. Um, and also what I found myself experiencing was, was actually a lot of um, disturbance literally in my head. When my brain was hurting, my head was hurting because it was, it was going through the, almost like the death throes of something that I had as my own pattern. And so in terms of, you know, living science, absolutely. I've, I've really felt it. I've really felt it. And, and yet it's shifting my whole vantage points on, on some really practical things of how I engage with my colleagues, of how I'm engaging with my family, dealing with some very practical and sometimes edgy situations. Um, around home or finance or whatever. It's, re it's almost like it's across the board. And, and, and my, my preference um, and also my need is, is to be able to speak about it. So that's why I've been sharing in, you know, in the context that's appropriate with colleagues, but also, um, you know, I really love being able to talk with, with Jim, yourself, and also Diane um, last week. It was really helpful to to just shed some more light on, on literally how, um, how intense it's been actually, which surprised me. Yeah, so that's what I can share. I've run into something today. Over the last couple of weeks or so, I started adding components to my gratitude journal of taking in the good and of ki acts of kindness. And today it was brought to my attention very clearly, and I put it in the chat. I don't think about kindness to myself. And to me, that's going to be kind of a real shift to kind of try to see um, how that plays out in my, in my inner soul and in myself. Um, I don't know if others have that, that, that bias or that, that wall or not. Well, I do, Lily, and I just wrote you, and I said, I, I'm, I often amaze myself how the very simple little acts of kindness that I could do to myself, especially in regard to taking care of my physiology, simple things like being kind and getting to bed at a decent hour, just small things like that, um, I'm completely overlooking. So when you wrote that in the chat, I started thinking about it myself. And, and yeah, that sounds kind of nice, doesn't it? To <laughs> be a little kind to yourself. But yeah, wow. What a revelation, huh? Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Be kind to yourself. Yeah. May I speak? Mm -hmm, please. Okay. Um, the, the three terms that I wrote down are trashing the roadmap, a moment of disturbance, and I'm going to add a belief that's blown. And... As a psychotherapist, to me, which relates to what Will and, and really all of you are saying, is that is an incredible moment of empowerment uh, in terms of negativity and positivity. Um, that absolutely is a positive moment, and that's a moment of really healing when we can connect with, uh, with ourselves and with others 
fields, uh, and it, it was something very, very important, very special about that moment. Um, any, any thoughts on that? People that have experienced it from either position, I'd love to hear from all of you on that. Does anybody have any input on that? I, I was going to make a comment, but I don't know if it's specific to that. And uh, I, I, I've gone in so many different directions listening. There's so much profound wisdom on this call. Um, and I guess, you know, we started this conversation uh, talking about what we do in the face of change. And, and just another piece to bring to this that kind of leads through all of this in my mind or in my heart is um, the power of prayer. And, and whether that's connecting whatever that is to everyone on the call, but connecting to the eco field in that way or, you know, whatever language you put to that. But I just, you know, in working with, you know, uh, I know I keep coming back to the people that I work with because they teach me so much. But in watching people go through immense crisis, their, their constant ability to um, connect with, uh, with creator and the land I think has allowed them to keep their indigenous heart and mind through cultural genocide. And I just feel, I don't know, I just, and, and their immense kindness. And, um, and I know you pointed that out, Lily, in your response to my email on Saturday, you know, the importance of uh, faith and um, faith and trust and how that connects to kindness and compassion and how, you know, we're talking about some big themes here. And the part that comes back to that piece about, um, you know, bringing compassion and kindness to self, it, regardless what I do, whether I start beating myself up and become my own abuser, um, I bring compassion to whatever is. I, I feel like that's part of getting out of the pessimism or whatever language you want to call it is to bring that kindness to oneself for even when your my mind has completely gone out of control and made all types of stories about the world. And so I, I, I really appreciate your path, Sarah, in regards to being able to, um, you know, uh, find this new way and this positivity. And I feel like there's part of me that really resonates with Will about um, what he said. And I look forward to talking more about um, this place of negativity. Uh, and it's not really negativity, this place of what is and the challenge of our world, how we, uh, and, um, how we label things, whether it be weather or, or whatnot. But by a lot of what everybody's saying. And I just want to say that in the power of prayer, yesterday I spent the day picking additional plants for Peace Nations people and some of the root vegetables that they've been praying to come back in the process of um, the herds of cattle that have been put across their, their natural lands, that their root vegetables are coming back in spades. And so we picked uh, all day we picked root vegetables and the, and the elders just spoke about the power of prayer, the power of that is bringing back their, their traditional plants. It, it's incredible. Anyway, it's just a really touching day. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. It's always so beautiful, isn't it, to hear what the restoration of the plant world and, and the uh, in, in response to that connection with the neural system of Mother Earth through prayer, and then to see it actually manifest before our eyes, that's incredible. And, and you know, really great blessings, and, and thank you for sharing that with us today. Anybody else have anything they want to add to Shauna's comments? Jim or Will, do you want to jump in, Dan? Will, are you going to jump in, or shall I jump in first? <laughs> Go ahead. I wanted to say a couple of things about obviously being on my own side is, this, is a part of kindness to myself. Um, and I think both of them are challenges for all of us. Um, but I was thinking as, as we were talking about it, two things. One, I notice that when I make a decision for my 10 year old son, Daniel, about what he should eat, et cetera, 
I'm quite, um, I discriminate, um, minimize the sugar, you know, maximize the vegetables and et cetera, the good things we know about. And very specifically, good water. Because as we know, just about everywhere now, good water is hard to find. And where we are, I have my own well, but the aquifer within from which the water is drawn has slowly become depleted in the last 10 years. And with increasing industrialization up the mountain for me, it's become less um, pure. And so I purify it. I boil it every day, et cetera. And um, I notice that what I say to myself, if there's not enough water is, okay, I'll give Daniel the good water because I'm old enough that no matter what happens, more pollutants aren't going to make me more sick. It's about a long term, that it, you know, but it's like denying myself. I have a good excuse. I'm older. I've been taking pollutants all my life. A little bit more is not going to hurt me versus my 10-year-old. So I practice now treating myself like I treat my 10-year-old because that's being kind to myself. Um, and as we were speaking, I had this real sense of how can I be kind to the earth if I'm not kind to myself? Because I am a part of this eco brain that subsumes me. And so here I am, this little part of this system, and I'm beating myself up like it doesn't have any effect. But in fact, it's my capacity to be on my own side, to be kind to myself. And obviously then that's contagious everywhere else. That is an essential element of joining in that sort of symphony Will describes of becoming a real part of what Mother Nature is offering us and being a, a constructive and productive and healthy component of the larger ecosystem within which we dwell. So it's just a, a further kind of motivation for me because in the end it comes down to what's my motivation to be kind to myself? What's my motivation to get up in the morning, etc. cetera? And um, I thank you, Will, because it gives me added motivation to know that how I treat myself is a direct relationship, has a direct relationship with how well my ecosystem is around me and everywhere I go. Your turn, Will. <laughs> the water's fine. Jump in, Will. The water's fine. Okay, so I want to circle back to something Shauna said uh, in terms of um, a way of our collaborating for next week. And I'm going to send this out in an email, but what I want to, to note is how, Shauna, you talked about your participating in the healing of a piece of uh, landscape where the plants are coming back through the power or the participation of prayer. That is intimate communication with what's larger than you. And, and so that was a beautiful story. And I'd like for all of us for next week to see if a, a short story comes to mind. Of, first of all, a personal healing. Like, Jim, what you just, you just said, that was a story of personal healing. Uh, and here's what I heard in your story. I, 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 it started out as being, well, I'm willing to drink the bad water on behalf of my son, 10-year-old son. But then it evolved into a story of, hey, maybe I could have good water too. <laughs> and, and so, see, that's the bifocal healing where where it's all intertwining it's it's deeply deeply connected so 
Next week, I, I look forward to each one of us having maybe two brief stories. One story is our own personal healing, small or large, small, medium, or large. <laughs> and uh, then also how somehow we know some mending, some restoring of the larger world around us. And maybe we had a personal participation in it, or maybe we didn't. Maybe we just saw that there was some healing taking place. Uh, a while ago, I guess a, a few Saturdays ago, uh, Kathy and I were talking about um, going to the grocery store and what she called the, the yoga of smiles. And uh, I'll let her say more about that. But, but, but I, I've noticed that uh, um, if I am in the grocery store, and I'm having a good time, it seems like people respond to me in a, in a pleasant way versus I'm just, you know, I got, I got to get there, I got to get this, I got to get out of there, and so on. And if, if I can somehow have a good time, which it might include smiles or whatever, then, then there's a recursive collaboration with where I am. So I'd like to have some stories about that next week. And we'll enjoy that. And, and I'll reflect on it in, in, the, uh, in the reflections about how all of this fits together with our brains and with the larger ego brain. <laughs> okay. Kathy, would you be willing to share anything about that yoga of smiles? Um, Idea and intriguing. I like it. Could you say a few words about it? Um, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for remembering that, Will. You know what? I, I think of it as uh, like being a smile pioneer. I'm willing to be the first one to do it. Um, and that is part of what I think is important. I don't care if uh, people are having a hard time and I show up and smile. Like, I'm always willing to be the first one to give it a go. And um, I, it brings me back to uh, Will's original sharing about, um, or sorry, Jude, when Judith was sharing um, about how everybody just loved each other, right? Like that was kind of, you know, she just kind of was like, you know, I'm not really uh, up for all the details, but the bottom line is everybody just loved each other. So that, that smiling is, uh, it's a gateway to good times. Um, and I recommend you try it. And being so in my body, do it for yourself first. first. Right? It's, it's just an added bonus or icing on the cake if you get to be with other people when you smile. Um, but do it for yourself. How you feel your body shift when you smile. We can try it now. <laughs> right? it, it really, uh, and look what even happened, right? It caught us off guard made us laugh, but you can feel that move through the body. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful practice. Yeah, uh, Kathy, this is Will speaking. I wonder if you'd be willing to just do a little bit of research on the physiological effect of smile, smiles and laughter to bring to us next week. Yeah, I'd love to do that. I, I, I'd love to do that, and I want to remember to talk about um, also – how there's a trend of changing our faces using um it, it, like you know all the botox and those things that plump up your lips and all the different like and i know it's for beauty uh but it you you actually can lose your um connection to one another uh because your face doesn't move the same and we don't really understand each other as deeply or the smiles aren't as uh, as rich somebody's heart might be expanding but their face is unable to to show those subtleties uh, but, okay, I'll do, I'll, uh, I'll do some smile research, <laughs> some personal testing. And I think those subtle nuances that we observe in people's physiology mm -hmm. are, are so crucial to understanding one another. And when those are in some way blocked, it's, I think it's almost confusing. <laughs> yes. Uh, to the other person's understanding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that, that would, in and of itself would be very interesting to explore. Jim? 
Yeah, a couple of points. One, 30% of all communication is nonverbal. Mm. It's body. And so um, that's crucial to what we're saying. The second thing on smiles, I can send you some stuff if you like, Kathy. Thank you. Smiling, smiling, you touched on it. In, in Russia, they used to say, you Americans have a ready-made smile, which means you're not really smiling at me. You're lifting the corners of your mouth. And um, the, the neurophysiology of it is that unless a smile engages muscles throughout the entire face, it doesn't affect the brain. And so smiling is more than the mouth. It's the whole radiance of the face, including muscles around the eyes and the cheeks and the da 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 um, Very important, you know, because it does, as you're saying, it reflects your feeling in your heart, mm -hmm. not just, oh, yeah, I'm going to smile at this person because my mother taught me to smile and da da da, -da. Right. Um, So it's a very important piece of neurophysiology. It's as, as well as all of what you're talking about, the yoga of smiling. So um, I'd love to, you know, for you to tell us more about it. It's very important. All right, I'll do. I, I have to go. I have an appointment. Um, love to everybody. Blessings. Um, don't say anything really fun and cool because I got to go. Save it for me next week. Bye, Kathy. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. So it... it we are at the end of our hour and a half um, on Friday because I wasn't able to be involved the whole time. I mentioned that if people wanted, I would continue to talk for a bit. So we'll keep the line open. Dan, is that okay with you? Are you available to keep the line open for a little bit longer? Absolutely. So why don't we just continue for a bit and as you need to go, just let us know and disconnect, but we'll go for another 15, 20 minutes anyway. So Jim, I've got another appointment and I'll be leaving, but I'll, I'll see you guys on Friday and then again next week. Great, thanks Will. Yeah. Oh, Will, darn, before he left, I was gonna show him the new the new issue of, sci of Scientific American Mind is the sexual brain. And one of the articles was called The Sunny Side of Smut. So for Will, you know, the research shows there is a positive side of porno. Um, but I'm gonna do a little, the next, in two weeks when I talk again, I'm gonna do a little bit on the orgasmic mind and the, in a sense, the neuropsychology of sexuality, because it's so much more than, you know, reproduction, let's say, and what we all associate with that. So other comments? Hey, Jim, I wanted to share before I have to get off. Um, I just want to go back to... Um, I don't remember what exactly. It's been so many rich things that's been said, but I believe there was something about when the plans have been changed um, or what have you. I just want to say this is very, very on time for me because the last probably week or two during my meditation time, I've been uh, making more of an intention to find what I call the brilliance in negativity. And I know soon we're going to have another word to describe this negativity or there'll be something more honoring um, to refer to negativity. But um, one of the practices that I've installed, if you will, have been separate myself as the observer and the uh, participant. And I'm not sure where I picked up this whole idea about observer, but I know I've picked it up from somewhere else. But I've kind of sophisticated this process for myself in terms of um, taking a moment to, when I can, pause and allow that part of me that observe why am I doing what I'm doing, even if it's a plan that I may have put together and it failed and I have these different emotional reactions to it, um, separate myself from the emotion and allowing the observer, if you will, to educate the participant, that part of me that is a, that responds, um, the part of me that 
um, that react, being able to kind of install that process to say, okay, step back and see what's happening. Um, see why maybe the stress buildup is happening. See why the negativity of what you believe to be negative, why is this being produced? And really um, digging through it, combing through it, and finding the brilliance in whatever the moment may be, be it that my schedule has shifted or changed for a much greater purpose, um, be it a lesson that is being taught in a current time that's preparing me for something else in the future. Um, so that's the piece that I wanted to add, as you say, that being able to speak is part of the installation. I've never been one to be shy to speak, but um, there's just so much that everyone shares. I'm just like, oh my gosh, what little am I going to have to be able to share? But thank you everyone for sharing and thank you for listening. Rod, can I make one comment quickly? Because you your sort of, your last your last sentence reminds me of when I took asked. I don't know if any of you remember Winter Earhart, but he had a very popular weekend training called Earhart Seven Hours Training Best. And it was quite powerful getting into, you know, deeper issues, et cetera. And so I'm in the audience, and when it comes time to share, people stand up and say and tell the most unbelievably suffering stories about their lives to get closure. And I'm there like, Jesus, I've never had this bad. These people really need this. I'm not going to say anything because my story is, <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, your story is as important as anyone else's because one of the things I learned was all of us believe our suffering is as bad as everyone else's. And what I was doing was resisting, you know, sharing and opening my heart and listen, you know, letting go of my suffering. And it took me two and a half days before I stood up and realized, hey, I'm, you know, I deserve as much of this as everybody else does. Absolutely. So we welcome your sharing from now on. Thanks, Rod. Yeah. Thank you. Um, May I speak now, Jim? Please, Lily. Uh, I call it the dance, Rod. You dance left and look what one side of it, maybe the negative or whatever, and then you dance right and look and step right and look at the other side of it. Then you Love step it. back in your dance to the witness. Wow. And then when you can see both sides of it from that dance back, then you can dance forward to a decision. I call it the dance, the four step dance. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Jim, I'm glad to hear that I wasn't the only person that it took two and a half days of sitting in one of those S seminars to let it all out because I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. Just for the days, right? <laughs> yep. So, um, the floor is open for anyone to say whatever they want, but in the absence of a comment, I wanted to bring up another topic that we've talked about before that's important to me. And I was thinking about it with you, Shauna, particularly, because we've talked about it. And that is, you know, I think we did well today with how is this having an impact in our world, our personal world. Okay, most of us would say, well, you know, one of the things I'm, I've learned here is how to good, has done some good things for me, et cetera. What I'm interested in is what about the larger world? So much of what we talk about, in a sense, infers some degree of comfort. Um, it's hard to imagine being grateful for something as a young child, you know, in the Middle East today, in Syria, for example. And I know some of you work with people whose lives are very, very difficult. So I just wanted to bring up the topic, either for now or some other time, about how do we take this into the world? What do we do in a world that is in such turmoil with inner processes that help us do better. But 
is a challenge to, to adapt to someone who's in much more dire circumstances than, for example, I am. You can talk about anything. You don't have to talk about that. See, Constantina, every time I ask a question, everybody goes quiet. You have a better way of asking questions. <laughs> Oh. Well, does anybody else have anything they just want to let hang out there and just share? Well, in particular, anything? I was going to, um, I was going to comment, oh, Jim, I was going to just comment on your question. Um, I would take it out to the larger world. And my way may be, where I look at it from the perspective of a quieter, um, smaller way, uh, right now with my work. And an example may be uh, working with a, an artist that may be certainly even internationally known or a writer that has writer's block and yet has a bestseller perhaps in the past. But both of these people, even with their individual work, then absolutely go out and influence many other people and certainly the world. And so I, I think that has to be remembered too, that um, you know, all of us in our own individual way um, very much affect um, those other equal fields. So that's, that's just a little bit to add that you know, my work has very much included um, working with those people who have been out there and are gonna bring it out in a way that certainly some of us uh, can't ourselves. Um, and that's brought great, great pleasure. Um, it, it's really very, very nice for me to, to know that. Thank you. So, I think about, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, connecting to, to something that, that you spoke, Jim, and, and around the, um, connecting to, you could say the bigger picture, whatever the bigger picture is, because um, I think there's levels of scale. As you were speaking about it, I um, thought of Prigogine's uh, quote around the system being far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence in the sea of chaos have the capacity to shift the system to a higher order. And for me, you know, as a, however we call ourselves, whether a pioneer or a change agent or a healer, there's something about addressing, addressing our own um, coherence. So that's the gift in terms of the personal, then we're in the, the nature of the field here and exploring and um, tuning, fine tuning, um, going off out of tune <laughs> as we go to our next level. Cause I think that's part of it. Um, but there's, for me, there's a, there's a recognition that as we engage with any of these kind of practices, there will be impact. There's a, that we, we, you know, as we step out of our doors, if we've had an understanding around something that creates a shift, whether we're smiling, whether we're, you know, psychotherapists, whatever level, there is the possibility of opening to a, um, to a larger level of healing. And so, you know, I think that's ongoing. Um, but I think there's something about recognizing that the, um, every moment we have the, have the possibility of making change. So, you know, which is beyond ourselves. And Sarah, I wanted to ask you, do you find as you go about your day and everyone else too. Do you are you able to keep this awareness in your mind? Do you find that other things crowd in upon it, and and you aren't intentionally acting upon the things that you just said, or do you find it's coming fairly easily for you at this point? So for me, I would say it's been it's been very very um, present. It's been very present as a as a practice. I'm I'm notice I'm noticing even when I'm not practicing, but right. I think that's the witnessing awareness. It's probably I'm on the back step, as you were yeah. saying, Lily. Yes. 
Um, but it's really present. And just in the noticing, and if I can, I can shift the balance, you know, get a new sense of equilibrium for myself, then, um, you know, I see that as a, as a positive move. But it's, it's very, very present. And I think that is the key, the shifting of the balance uh, on, mm. a, on a continual basis. Uh, because for myself, when I get off balance at times, I would just kind of like, oh, well, you know, throw my hands up in the air and like, okay, well, it's not working. But it's that, that kindness to yourself to continue to shift the balance. And, and it's okay uh, when we get off balance and moving back into the and I guess with that, I've, I've kind of likened it to, um, I know when I go kind of too far with the practice. So literally, I've been having lots of kind of, um, I mean, literal headaches. When I, f I literally feel the shift within myself, and it's like going to the gym and, and lifting too many weights right. for too long. <laughs> yeah. Because if we see this as a practice, you, yeah. you have to um, pace yourself. And so, you know, it's, it's a really physical thing, but I think you need to notice when it's like, oh God, you know, right. yeah, the balance. And on, that, on that note, Sarah, it reminds me of something um, I learned a while ago, and I'm just gonna read this little thing I keep on my vision board. My biggest growth comes from overcoming my moments of great resistance, negativity, and fear. I, I realized years ago that when I stop, when I feel tired, headache, and I'm not going to do the practice, oh, I don't want to do this, I'd rather go to sleep, is the moment when I'm about to have a breakthrough. And all of the resistance me that doesn't want to let go of the status quo, all of which is, is positive. It's, it's the unconscious holding on to what has always protected us and not knowing that the breakthrough is our next great protection. You know, we, we resist incredibly, and I still go through it, you know, like at night, gratitude journal. You know, I was like, geez, I don't want to remember. I think I'll just watch a movie on Netflix. Well, remember, you know, your brain takes the shape of what your mind rests upon, and oh God, I gotta do that again, you know? But I also remember there's something holding me back here, and if I just go a little bit further, it'll be a little easier next time. Mm -hmm. So I relate completely to what you're saying, and, and um, we have to just monitor ourselves and know ourselves well enough to know when to let go and when to stop, and start again, and when to push through a little bit, you know? I'm the I'm, you know, I have similar experiences as you, Sarah, so I appreciate your sharing it. Anybody else open to reveal yourself a little bit? Trying to see who we've got left on the call here. Pretty much everybody. Can I ask one last thing? I'm so sorry, and I'm going to oh, bed. It's three, almost three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so, right. Jim, can you can you speak to the Heart Math Institute? I'm actually looking at um, doing or uh, going through the certification starting in July, and um, I'm just I would like to hear some of your feedback. I know that you spoke to um, the research during the class, but just anything extra you can share. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now, I, mean, I don't, didn't quite get the question, Constantina. What was the question? Or what? He'd like, did I hear this right, Rod? You would like, I broke up too a little bit, but would you like him to expound more on the heart math concepts that he brought up? Yes, if he yeah. can, because I've, I've been looking at And the, you're going to start that certification process? Correct. In yeah. July is what I'm planning to. So if he can just speak more to so, it. Okay. Now. okay. Did you so, get Rod, Rod I'm, I'm glad to do that. I was, um, just to give you a little background, and then my recommendation is, given your time thing, et cetera, let's make a separate appointment and we can talk about it, okay? But let me give you a little background. Um, 
when I was, I wrote a book in 1999 um, on the, on the, you know, a millennial book. Um, and, and um, I'm just looking for it here. Your home, your Y2K personal production plan. That's one of my books, your Y2K personal production plan. Anyway, Doc Childry, who was the founder of Hard Math and is its primary guide, um, was also very interested in what was going to happen with Millennial Bugs. So he and I became good friends. And I trained as a heart, and I became licensed as a heart math trainer. So I have since um, the last 10 years or so been out of touch a bit, but I'm also the um, advisor for a PhD student in the Wisdom School who's doing his PhD on neuroscience and is also going to do heart math stuff. So I'm recontacting them to introduce them to my, to, to Kim, um, our graduate student. And after you and I talked for a bit, I'd be glad to, you know, introduce you to some people there. So to go in with some degree of contact. But it's, I would say from my experience, it's the best thing there is in relation to really deepening your awareness of your heart and what's possible through the heart. And one last testimony from my own point of view. Um, I was very, I, 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 I became very proficient in their system. And I'm really good now at getting my heart into a degree of coherence. Um, and that was demonstrated a couple of years ago. I was at a conference where HeartMath was demonstrating their their um, tools, they have a little machine that can show you your heart rate variability. And I hadn't been involved with them for about eight years at that point. And um, so he hooked me up. And because they show you, you know, how incoherent your heart is and et cetera. And he hooked me up and he said, this is extraordinary. Have you ever done our training? Your heart is in complete coherence. And it was like, that was because of the years of practice. It wasn't because I kept doing it every day. It just became a part of me. And, um, and so I highly recommend it. And I'm more than happy to schedule a time where you and I could talk about it in more detail. Email me and we'll set up something. I, I will. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So what do you think, Constantina? Anything else? It's about... Well, I think we're about ready to wrap up. And before we do, I really want to thank everybody for your willingness to contribute. Because I know I'm going to take away so many things that you shared that if we had just had class time with a lecture, it wouldn't have helped me incorporate the practice in the same way your willingness to open up and share your life and your insights and, and to be vulnerable to do so. I really do thank you for that. It's almost like what real friendship is like. So I appreciate it very much to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that- So we're gonna continue. Yeah, we'll continue this on Friday. And if anyone cannot be there on Friday, let me know and we'll see if we can set up a, um, an alternate date this week for everyone who can't come on Friday. And then um, acts of kindness. Kindness, kindness, kindness. Smile and be kind. <laughs> Everything you be living or what you don't believe is living because it's all alive. It knows. It knows. <laughs> okay, see you all next session, whenever that is. Thank you, everyone. Whenever that is. Blessings Bye. to everyone whenever it is we get everyone. together again. Hmm. This is Alice signing off. Blessings. And Constantina. Yep. Love and light to all from Cass. Thanks, Cass. <laughs> right.